I think we are live. Justin, do you see us? All right. We are live. That's great. Awesome. Yes. Who says that live audio is dead? <laughs> Who says that there's no live music? No live audio. Everyone, hi. How are you? I am glad to see you all out in Sonic Scoop land, in MixCon land. Nate, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. How are you? I can sincerely say that at this moment, I have never been better. <laughs> <laughs> because I am really happy to be on with you. And uh, I'm also happy that it's Friday. Yeah, and, for sure. And I, I think I have may have told you this story. You know, I got my career started doing uh, uh, drum journalism, interviewing live drum, interviewing drummers like from bands, like I started with Drum Magazine. Uh, hey everyone, I see people are joining. It's, it's great to see you. Before I go any further, let me introduce myself formally. This is David Weiss from Sonic Scoop and I am here with Nate the Great Baglios, co-founder and VP of marketing for Cali Audio. And Nate, let me ask you again, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Okay, great, good. Um, so anyway, I was going to say that uh, I interviewed in my career hundreds of drummers uh, for Drum Magazine, and some of the, some of the greatest drummers of all time: uh, Ringo Starr, Stuart Copeland, uh, and uh, though I will tell you that they are not among the group who said this to me. So uh, I I interviewed drummers all the days of the week, and. When they would, when I would get on the phone with them initially, I learned that not to say this. They, if it were a Friday, be like, "Hey man, how's it going?" I'd be like, "I'm great. It's Friday." And do you know what they inevitably said? They say, "It is." <laughs> <laughs> they never knew the right. uh, the touring. Why did you need to right. The touring drummers never knew what day of the week it was, which makes me wonder, how did they know to call me on the right day and time? Right. <laughs> Managers. Yeah, that's that's what I came to realize, that somewhere there was a touring tour manager who was pushing a phone into their hand and saying, talk to this person when they say hello. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. So anyway, so so yeah, that happened so often that I learned never to say, hey, it's Friday, to a touring musician. But I could say it to you, uh, again, with all sincerity. So, Nate, so thanks a lot for joining us. And again, happy Friday to all of you in MixCon 2020 land. And I don't have to, unfortunately, worry about you being touring musicians right now. Uh, probably very few of you out there are. But yes, I'm thrilled to be here with Nate. Cali Audio has been a great friend to Sonic Scoop, and it's been amazing watching them grow into a force in studio monitoring in just a couple of years. Uh, everyone out there, while we're talking, if you have a question for Nate, please don't hesitate to drop a question into the live chat window on the right. We'll get to as many questions as we can about monitor design, placement, and all things audio. Uh, so Nate, again, welcome. How did you like Maria Alisa Ayerbe's Mixing Masterclass, which we premiered on MixCon earlier this week? Oh, I thought it was great. It was really cool to see her insights. I really liked how in-depth she got into the mix. Um, and I like that uh, she, picked a, she picked something that wasn't necessarily the most standard um, piece of music to mix. Um, doing something in a different language with a different voice part um, with a sort of urban reggaeton. Um, genre leaning uh i thought was great yeah terrific well i've really enjoyed watching it and um we're getting phenomenal response on that video uh it's uh, it's really gotten a great deal of views right away and the comments uh from people have just been fantastic so uh we were glad to uh have her as a part of mixcon and and for her to be on the on the cali audio video no less uh so um, before we start getting to some of the questions uh, that, that we're getting from our audience, I want to, first, I want to ask you about the origin story of Cali Audio, because I think it's a really interesting story, and, and I don't think everybody knows it. So can you tell us how the company yeah, got started? Absolutely. So um, the five of us who started Cali were all working together at another company. 
um, and had all sort of learned to work together and to like each other working on these projects that were really research and development focused. Um, and that was really fun. Um, and, you know, an engineer would pull you into a lab and be like, check this out. Um, and it'd be cool. Uh, and as corporate structures changed and as ownership changed, that became less of a possibility at the company we were working at. Um, and we kind of knew what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. Um, we got the opportunity to put some capital together um, and broke off and went off on our own um, and started Cali um, and hit the ground running uh, with the design for a studio monitor with the LP6. Wow, that's fantastic. Was it was it scary for you to to go out on your own like that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, all of us talked with our significant others and I think our significant others uniformly uh, reacted with that first conversation to what the hell are you doing? Um, <laughs> I'm like, you got this steady gig, it pays well, you don't have to worry about it. Do you really want to be doing this for yourself? Um, and got some advice from some of the people that we were working with, which is pretty much like, this is going to be the most exhilarating and terrifying time of your life, getting a small business off the ground. And that was the most sage advice I'd ever heard. Um, yeah, that continues to play out. Um, there are times that are absolutely thrilling there are times when it's like, we're going to lose it all. Um, <laughs> but for the most part, it's been great. Um, I think that uh, the success of our designs in the marketplace has spoken for itself for a large part. Um, and I think we are moving into a phase where it's a lot of fun. And in terms of being able to work for ourselves, not being under any sort of corporate structure, um, that's been fantastic for us as people and I think for the products that we make. That's terrific. And I think a lot of the people out in our audience today can relate with what you're doing. If you're going to be a, an audio engineer, a producer, a mixer, a mastering engineer in audio post, in, in so many of the um, uh, audio professions, you, you're taking a chance, right? Whether you're doing it with a company or doing it based on your art, uh, we're, we're all taking chances. And But I, I don't know if everyone uh, is aware of, of the chances that people have to take to make the equipment that they work with, the, the hardware and, and software. For, for all those, it, there, there was almost certainly a big chance uh, behind yeah. that. So yeah. thank you for taking that chance. And, and uh, I certainly can relate as well uh, with Gang Sonic <laughs> Scoop started and, and uh and yes, there are terrifying moments and exhilarating moments and, and, and everything in between. But uh, really the, the, the great opportunity is to grow a brand uh, yeah. and, and see, see where that goes and how's that, how that flourishes. And that's what, that's what everyone out there is doing with their music too. So uh, we applaud you for that, for taking those risks. So Nate, why don't you get us up to date about where Cali Audio is today. What's the, what's the range What's the range of monitors that you're offering, and and what differentiates them? Yeah, I'll try to keep it short and sweet. Um, so we have the LP6 at $149, and that's our six-inch two-way studio monitor. And then its big brother is the LP8, which is a 199 eight-inch two-way studio monitor. Um, and then we move it to the Independent series. Um, which are three-way studio monitors. Currently, there's only an eight-inch, but maybe there's more coming. Um, who knows? A scoop. Uh, a scoop. We want um, that scoop. Tell me first, Nate. Uh, so um, the IN series, what's special about this is that it uses a coaxial mid-range and tweeter assembly. Um, and so you get the benefits of coaxial speaker with that really excellent imaging that that provides and the benefits of a three-way speaker where the tweeter and the woofer are unburdened because of the mid-range. So you get much lower uh, harmonic distortion um, without the drawbacks that are typically associated with either of those systems. So because the woofer and the mid-range tweeter are separated from each other, acoustically, it's still a point source. The, those are still close enough in space to be well within a quarter wavelength of the top end of the woofer. Um, but it means that the woofer isn't vibrating around the tweeter. So you don't get that intermodulation distortion at high output that you typically see uh, from a coaxial speaker. Okay. And again, 
because in the mid range and tweeter being coaxial, you don't get the uh, phase interactions that you normally get with a three way system. Um, the other thing that this means is that uh, we took a lot of time to design the waveguide in our two way speakers to make sure that in the horizontal plane, um, there is a match between at the crossover point between the directivity of the woofer and the tweeter. Basically what that means, the imaging is really, really nice yep. uh, on the two-way speakers, but you can't do that uh, as well in the vertical dimension because of the separation of the woofer and the tweeter. And that's the case with any two-way mm -hmm. design where you have a tweeter woofer. That's, you're just never gonna be able to solve that problem. So this three-way design does solve that problem. Um, and it's something we're really proud of and something that wink, wink, as we come out with new products um, is going to be sort of a leader for us. Great. All right. Well, we're looking forward to that. And, and regarding the imaging, I can certainly say the first time I heard Cali Audio Monitors, that's that's what leapt out at me uh, instantly was, was the imaging and, and how well I felt I was hearing the stereo field and, and everything within it. Um, so we're getting some good questions from our audience. And so I'm going to start with Gerhard Schoner, and thank you for your question, Gerhard. He wants to know, how does the speaker size correlate with room treatment? For example, in a room that is not treated well, would a smaller speaker be the wiser choice? That's, that's a really tough question. Um, the very, very simple answer is the worse that your room plays uh, with bass, the better it is to not introduce that problem at all. In other words, if you've got a problem, if you've got a room that has a lot of low end problems, use a speaker without a lot of low end. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. You know, don't, don't play into those problems. The simpler answer is that um, for us, for Cali, uh, we don't have a speaker that plays a lot lower than any of our other given speakers. The LP8 and the IN8 only go uh, two hertz lower, they go down to 37, whereas the LP6 goes to 39. Um, so the, there's not a significant low end difference um, in our speakers. Um, if you have a problem with bass in your room, the first thing to do is to see if there's a place where you can put the speakers in that room um, that doesn't excite that problem as much. Uh, and that's um, what I would say is basically try that first. Um, if you've got a speaker, um, move it around to a bunch of different points in your room and try different speaker placements and listening positions. There might be a place where the bass isn't so much of a problem and actually works really, really well. Um, but in terms of correlation between speaker size and room size, you know, a lot of people will say, well, this speaker is eight inches, so it's too big for this 10 by 10 room. That's not really, there's no real science behind that other than this speaker has a lot of bass, this room has a lot of bass problems, so don't use them together. Um, you can have a small room that works really well on the low end, although that is kind of difficult. Um, you can have a big speaker that actually doesn't have a lot of bass. Um, so there's no, there's no way to say, use this size speaker in this size room. Okay. Right, okay, I see. And I think that pertains to something that we discussed, Nate, uh, earlier that uh, before that maybe we'll get to later about rules versus no rules. Uh, right. right. So I'm looking forward to that. Now we have another question from Ray Manuel Music, who is a person of few words. He says, Cali LP6 plus sub versus IN8. Ooh, uh, well, the question is what's the sub <laughs> in that case? Um, and also what are you mixing? Um, so I, uh, I just set up, I just moved and I'm in a larger space now, which I'm really happy about. I have the opportunity. Um, this is sort of our Cali HQ for me, at least. Um, we don't have an office, obviously, because we just started and there's a pandemic afoot. Um, so I have listening setups in three different spaces in my home. So I've got a system in the garage, a system right here, and a system in the dining room, um, all of which are to give me reference points for the, for, uh, the speakers. Um, and I have the sub in here. Um, and what I'll say is if you need the sub, uh, get the sub. Don't get speakers that play a little bit lower. Get a subwoofer because there's a real difference between, mm -hmm. you know, this five inch or six inch speaker plays down to 50 or 40 or, you know, 37 hertz or whatever it is. 
this uh, eight inch speaker plays down to 35 Hertz, maybe that's a really good eight inch speaker that plays that low. Um, and if you need that 20 to 40 range, you need a subwoofer. If that's something that you're mixing, especially if you're doing um, not all hip hop, but a lot of hip hop, uh, especially anything you might be mixing for a club, you're gonna need that sub. Um, and especially if you're doing anything in film, um, low frequency effects, that sort of thing, you need that 20 to 40 range. Um, so I think that's the question to ask yourself. Do I need 20 to 40? If you do, yes, LP6 plus a sub is the way I would go. If you don't need that range uh, and you don't have the budget for IN8 plus a sub, which is really, it's nice. Um, <laughs> uh, then yeah, get the IN8s. The IN8s um, are definitely better than the LP6s. Got it. I see. Uh, Nate, uh, I had the opportunity to hear, or should I say feel, the Watts sub last time I saw you in Anaheim. Uh, and you didn't mention, you didn't talk about your sub specifically, but what do you want to let us know uh, about the Watts sub? Yeah, so um, we actually get a, a reasonable number of questions about this. You know, is the, the Watts sub seems like it's really powerful. Is it really made for the LP6? And the answer is yes. Um, the Watts sub is a thousand watt studio subwoofer. It plays down to 23 hertz. It's got a 123 dB max SPL. So it's big. It's a, it's a big honking subwoofer. And the thought around it originally was there is kind of a dearth of subwoofers that are made to do 5.1 with the uh, entry level speakers. Um, so our speakers or anything that's in that similar price point. Um, there's a lot of good subs for 2.1, but there's nothing that you can kind of upscale really easily. So that was, our, that was our biggest thing that we wanted to tackle. And then moving into a subwoofer with that kind of capabilities, this becomes a subwoofer that you can take out and play live with. Um, and then we introduced it in the middle of the pandemic and I'm not sure anyone has used it live yet. Um, but the thought behind it is, especially for people who are in a smaller space, uh, especially for people who don't own pickup trucks, if they want a sub that can be their sub, it's a studio sub and it goes with them to a gig, this is a good choice for them. And if they're playing gigs with like a Bose L1 or an Eon One or uh, like Mackie Thump, any of those smaller PA systems, this is gonna be enough sub to really give them that boom, boom, boom. Um, and of course it can live under their desk so they can produce with it as well. Okay, I got it. The one thing I'll say is Nate though, is I believe everyone does own a pickup truck today. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> so. But if if you want your mileage to be just a little better with your pickup, <laughs> right? Maybe, right? You don't, you don't, you won't go that route. Um, so now we have another interesting question from Madge Prometheus, who says, "On the LP6, does the internal jumper successfully stop the amp going into standby at low volumes?" So, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. So if you are in Europe, and this only applies to Europe, um, there is uh, on LP6s and LP8s and IN8s manufactured before March 22nd of this year, um, there is a standby mode. We have since removed the standby mode because it was just a headache. Um, sometime for a lot of people, it was kicking on. Um, so the speakers were going into standby at low volumes. Um, for a lot of other people, the speakers wouldn't wake up unless they were hitting them with um, too much volume for their space. So as of now, standby is removed from our speakers. So if you have a, uh, a LP6 or an LP8 or an IN8 uh, in Europe that was manufactured before that date, and if you look in the manual on our website, we've got a little blurb how to tell when it was manufactured. Um, Yes, if you change the jumper, it will take it out of standby mode. That will work. If, if you're in the United States or if you're not in Europe um, and your speaker is going into standby mode, it's defective. Uh, you should get in contact with your retailer for a replacement. And if you're outside of your retailer's window for replacement, um, there's a one year warranty. Get in touch with us directly. Um, there's a form on our website to do that and we'll replace the speaker directly for you. All right, got it. I hope that that helped you, Prometheus. Thank you, Nate. Uh, I'm gonna 
get to another question now from, from Gerhard Schoner. Gerhard, thank you for your questions. And anyone else who's out there, if you have a question, don't hesitate. Let us know. We want to hear from you. <laughs> uh, all right. Now, uh, Gerhard says, let's say you have a 700 euro budget. How much to spend on speakers? How much on room treatment for your living room? And he says, try to be unbiased. I know you sell speakers. Ah. Wrote an exclamation point, but I would have put a smiley face. <laughs> um, yeah, 700 euro budget. I would get uh, either LP6s or LP8s and then spend the rest on treatment. Um, or, 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 big or here, get, spend three or 400 euros on speakers. Spend 80 to 100 euros on a measurement microphone. Right. Um, and before you buy any treatment, measure your system. Um, there's a free piece of call software called Room EQ Wizard um, that we actually use extensively. Uh, they take donations. If you're in a position to donate, we couldn't recommend that uh, more highly. Um, measure your space. Um, and Dave, you and I have talked about this previously before. Um, whether you're in a studio or whether you're in a home listening environment, um, if you have the opportunity to set the speakers up in different orientations, in different parts of the room, different lengths from the wall, try it all before you commit to anything because there are going to be better and worse places to put the speakers. And that's ultimately going to determine how much money do you need to spend for treatment. Um, if you find a space in your room that really, really works, maybe all the treatment that you need is a bookcase uh, on either side of the room to act as, uh, as a diffractor um, for those first reflections. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, before you spend money on treatment, figure out what your problem is, or if you even have a problem. Um, and then, you know, with a laser surgical focus, fix that problem now that you know what it is. But yeah, I would say absolutely build into your budget $100 for a measurement microphone, $5 to pitch to uh, Rumi Q Wizard as a thank you for this great software, learn how to measure your space, and then tackle the problem. Right. I, I think that's terrific advice. Uh, Nate, the other thing I'm impressed about is that you knew how to convert to euros. <laughs> <laughs> You 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 have a you have a massive mind, my friend. <laughs> I'm super impressed. Now, uh, Ray Manuel Music has another question as well. He said, "Is there an IN6 an IN6 future plan?" There is no plan for an IN6. Um, there are plans for future products in the IN line. All right, short. Short and sweet, meeting, meeting for short and sweet. So those future plans, and of course, you'll find out about those as they break and develop on sonicscoop.com. And you should subscribe to our newsletter. It's free if you want. All right, now, uh, okay, moving down the list. Um, uh, oh, here's an interesting question from Addie Abadi, and I like your name, Addie Abadi. Hi. What is the sleep function and is there a way to keep it on all the time? Yeah, so the sleep function, this is what I mentioned previously. Um, uh, European models built before March of this year had a sleep function. Um, we have removed that now. Um, and so as of now, all of the speakers just stay on all the time. Um, if you want the speakers to turn off when you're not using them, a really easy way is just put them on a surge protector and use that as an on-off switch. The speakers have a limiter built in. Um, using that as an off switch won't cause uh, any damage to the speakers. Um, that's a fine way to go about it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good. We're, we're finding solutions here. Uh, and that's really good. Here's, here's not so much a uh, performance or technical question, but one of aesthetics from Darnell Evans Sr. Hi, Darnell. Will the LPs come in any new colors like red? That is a really good question. Um, probably. <laughs> um, we don't have any specific plans right now, but um, the LP6 has done really well in both black and white. Um, and we are exploring some options to bring them out in different colors. Okay. Um, as uh, 
sort of uh, seasonal specials. We don't, um, part of leaving a large corporation and doing this for ourselves um, meant that our pricing model doesn't leave room for us to offer specials. Um, so we don't do Black Friday specials. We don't offer discounts at certain times of the year um, that we really can't afford to. Um, so what we can do though, is offer them in different colors and have some limited editions um, and do that. So that's the sort of thing to look out for. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, again, thanks for your questions, everybody. I, I see them coming on. Uh, Josh Reyes wants to know, will we see a 10 inch three-way from Cali anytime soon? Ooh, um, define soon. <laughs> um, uh, it, it has been thought of, um, without giving too much away, what I can say is it would not be a product in any of our current product lines. Um, but there has been some discussion of, of a very large format three-way speaker. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, now swinging back to a technical question from cloud nine, that's with a K Nate cloud nine. Um, is there an optimum distance to sit away from the ion eights to experience their full range? Thank you. Uh, there is not an optimum distance, but there is an optimum window. Um, so we typically recommend to be at least a meter away from the speakers. Um, and then 2.8 meters is as far away as you can be in anechoic space. So it's different when you're in a room, but you know, add a little bit here and there, nine feet roughly. Um, uh, and what that is, is you have 85 dB continuous with, uh, 20 dB dynamic headroom um, and what we feel to be a reasonable amount of distortion. Um, so any more than that, and if you still want that sort of output, the speakers are going to start to hit the limiter. Okay, okay, all right. Thank you, that's a, a very precise answer. Um, all right, now uh, Ray Manuel Music has another question which I think is interesting. When using room correction like sonar works, should I still use the dip switch, say, if I'm close to the front wall or leave it flat? Uh, yeah, I would use, here's the process I would go through with uh, Sonarworks is um, set up the speakers in your room, listen to them, um, try the dip switches and determine which one uh, you like better. Um, and normally this should be pretty easy. Um, the dip switches I would say in 98% of cases are exactly what you need them to be. So the dip switch for your scenario should be the better option. What that's going to mean is that sonar works is going to be doing less work. Um, so the speakers are built to do that processing for themselves. It's not really going to affect the dynamic range of the speaker or the output of the system. Um, so use what we've built and then use sonar works on top of that. Okay. All right. There you go. Thank you, Nate. Uh, next, Gray Songbird uh, is following up on when you talked about utilizing measurement mics. They want to know, could you recommend a good measurement mic? Yeah. Get the Sonarworks mic. Okay. Um, yeah. If you get um, reference for, uh, it comes, there's a bundle that comes with the mic that's only like a little bit more. Um, and it comes with a calibration file, um, which is great. Um, uh, at the price, it is difficult to find a cheaper mic with a calibration file. There is, if you're into the DIY pro audio slash audiophile aesthetic, uh, you go to minidsp.com and they recommend a microphone called the U mic, which is U M I K. Um, and that I think is 80 or $90 and comes with a calibration file as well. That's the biggest thing is, um, Measurement mics are measurement mics by and large. Um, you know, you can spend four grand on a mic. Um, for room correction, you're looking for some, some simple, stupid things that are happening under uh, 700 Hertz for the most part. Um, you don't need a mic that'll tell you what's going on precisely at 40K. Um, so um, yeah, spend as little money as possible and get something that comes with a calibration file. Um, and I use the Sonarworks microphone uh, myself, um, but I know that the U mic from Mini DSP works really well as well. All right, terrific. Nate, your experience is knocking us out. 
Now we're going to go to Chris LaRock says, obviously the Cali sub has its own delay and phase adjustment built in, but do you find an external crossover with a more variable delay time to be helpful when setting up subs? Absolutely. Yep. Um, so our sub is 599 and for 599, we've tried to give you as many options as possible um, to get it set up correctly uh, in your space and with your speakers and time aligned with the mains. Um, there's only so much we can do for 599. If you've got the budget to go get a real crossover, get it. Um, it's, that is going to be a huge uh, help for you. I got it. Um, anticipating that someone may ask, what do you consider to be a real crossover? Do, do oh, you have... geez. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, I honestly, I don't know. I don't have okay. enough experience with enough of them to, to tell you anything informed. Um, okay. Ask your Sweetwater sales engineer. <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, I stumped Nate. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's first time ever, I must say. Uh, now, uh, next is a question from Audio Test Kitchen, which is an amazing website and resource, and I do recommend everyone go check them out. Alex's piano, by the way. Oh, wow. Oh, we speak of Alex Awana, uh, who is one of the founders of Audio Test Kitchen there. Uh, so again, visit Audio Test Kitchen. Uh, he wants, I'm assuming this is you, Alex, uh, but ATK say, Hi, David. Hi, Nate. What's the number one quality that distinguishes Cali from other monitor options in the same price range? Um, value. Um, and that it, I would actually take out the in the same price range. The number one thing that distinguishes Cali from any of the competition is that we are building monitors um, to try and give you as much monitor as we can for your buck. Um, and so what distinguishes us as a company is the, the time and the money that we spend on research and development to develop technologies that cost you, the person who's paying for our speaker, very little money or no money, but offer you a big benefit. And so some of the things that I would point to are things like the port tube, um, which we killed an engineering laptop uh, running airflow simulations to develop. Um, things like the waveguide, um, which, like I said earlier, those precisely control the pattern of the speaker so that at the crossover point, um, the directivity of the tweeter and the woofer match, um, that takes a lot of math. Um, that takes a lot of engineering to do. But once we've done it, to make it out of plastic is free. We can make any shape we want. Um, and so that's the sort of thing where that isn't costing you any money, but you are recognizing a serious benefit this person buying our speakers um, from the work that we're doing. All right, great, thank you. And uh, for you there in St. Lucia, uh, who just asked, should we, we've got a new studio, should we invest in your monitors and why? I believe that, that Nate just answered that. Uh, and uh, so congratulations on, on your new studio and when it's all set up, uh, Rhythm House, Sonic Scoop wants to know about it. We, we love writing about studios all over the world and, uh, and we're excited to see it. So definitely let us know. I see that Andre Erlmeyer doesn't have a question, but he says, hello, and I want to be polite and say <laughs> hello back. So great to have you here. Thank you so much. Um, now let's see. Uh, the, our next question is from B S who says, are there any plans for integrated DSP room correction as opposed to the dip switches? There sure are. All right. That's all I'll say right now. <laughs> okay. Some answers are long, others are veiled in mystery. Uh, so, uh, okay, now I'm gonna, a few, so, some people have double questions. Hey, BL, BLRX, hello. Uh, it's great to see everyone here. And if other people have new questions, please, let us know. Here's another one from Maj Prometheus. I live in a sheltered flat, concrete walls, neighbors all retired. Do LP6s play flat at low volumes? They, yes, they do. Um, and I would recommend them heartily for anybody who's uh, needing to work in a space where they need to be volume limited. 
Um, the LP6s are fantastic for that. Okay. All right. There you go, uh, Prometheus. Let me let me keep scrolling through the questions here. Uh, and there were few, there were a few up there. Uh, I know that. Uh, let's see. Where what, there was an additional one, I believe, uh, from from someone, but I'm I'm missing it right now. So um, if someone has asked a question that I haven't answered yet. Uh, go ahead and put it again um, in the in the bottom there. And just re re ask it, and I will get to it. Um, all right. Now I had some other questions uh, as well that I wanted to ask you. Uh, in the meantime, and uh, oh yeah, Nate, what are the most common mistakes you see people making with their speaker setup, uh, and what are the fixes? Yeah, so I, I touched on this a little bit with some of the questions that I answered already. Um, yeah. The, the biggest thing, the biggest thing is to get the speakers in the right place in the room. Um, right. Uh, and I've said this before, um, I have seen studios with almost no treatment that sounded fantastic uh, because the speakers were in the right place. I have seen studios with thousands or tens of thousands of dollars worth of treatment that sounded horrible um because the speakers were just in the wrong place in the room or the room just was not working um there's only so every room uh is going to have modes which is where bass stacks up and is either uh constructive or destructive so in other words there are places in every room depending on the placement of the speakers where you either have too much low end at certain frequencies or almost no low end at certain frequencies and the trick is to put the speakers and yourself in the correct position so that at as many frequencies as possible below below 700 hertz generally but below 200 hertz more specifically um you're not sitting in any of those nodes where there's either way too much bass or way too little bass um if you are <laughs> um you gotta move <laughs> um there's no amount of treatment that's gonna that's gonna help um you know, bass traps can only do so much. Um, yeah, and certainly the sort of things that you might hang on a wall to control high frequency um, acoustic panels and that sort of thing, um, those aren't going to fix anything uh, below 50 hertz. Um, those, those are the wall as far as that wave is concerned. Um, and so, yeah, really take the time when you're setting up a studio to make sure that the speakers and your listening position are in the right place so that you're fighting as little as possible um, when you're setting up the room. And then if you are fighting a lot, um, before investing a lot in room treatment, um, something like Sonarworks can go a long way to help correct, um, especially minor things. You know, if you've got hmm, 60 dB here or there on the low end where you're, you're sitting in a node, using something like Sonarworks to correct that or MIDI DSP to correct that is a fine thing to do. Got it. Nate, have you, I'm just curious if you've walked into some studios that by looking at them, you were sure would not sound good, but then were surprised. Yeah. That they did. Yeah. Uh, I won't name any names, but a good friend of mine who works uh, in a studio in Venice beach. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a like full working professional studio and he's got um, a room on the second floor and it's kind of in the back. Um, and it's pretty live in there. He doesn't have a lot of treatment on the walls. Um, it's just got like an old wood door. Um, but that room sounds great. That room sounds fantastic. Um, we went and actually measured that room um, to verify our measurement method. Um, and it, that's one of the best sounding rooms I've been in. Um, right. Yeah. And I was, I was really surprised by that. Um, and impressed. Fantastic. Yeah, that's great. I, I can say, you know, I I visited hundreds of studios uh, with my time with Sonic Scoop and before that as New York editor for Mix Magazine. And I ha I've seen all types of studios too. Uh, some that look fantastic and, and don't really sound that great. And others that I call Millennium Falcons. Uh, <laughs> you are, you are not, you're not expecting any kind of accuracy. Uh, I've, I went into one where 
you couldn't even walk in. You actually had to crawl in uh, under, <laughs> under here. But the this person was responsible for some platinum mixes, and and the room sounded great. So, uh, so yeah, we see them all all over. Everyone, thank you for more questions. We're seeing them uh, come in uh, quickly again, uh, and we love we love getting them. So bring it now. Okay, uh, Ray Manuel Music wants to know. When placing the monitors, should the tweeters be at ear level or the center of the monitors? And will placing the monitors upside down affect the sound? Interesting question. Uh, yeah, so the tweeters should be roughly at ear level. Give yourself 10 or so degrees uh, off axis. You know, they don't need to be aimed directly at your ear, but they should be roughly at that level. Um, Yes, turning them upside down will change the sound in that that's a really easy way to change the level of the tweeter. Um, so uh, I've got too many wires hooked to my computer right now, but my front INAs, I actually have um, the tweeters at the bottom um, so that those tweeters are right at your level. And yeah, it makes a, it makes a huge difference um, versus having them too high up or too far down. Right, okay, all right, and, and did you say about Placing them upside down? Yeah, yeah. If it means that you can get the tweeters at ear level, put them upside down. Okay. Um, it's not going to, it's going to affect the sound as you perceive it because the tweeters are going to be in the right place. It is a positive thing. Um, and we recommend doing so. Okay. Wow. All right. Terrific. Uh, so now let's see. Uh, Mika Anatol, hello, or Anatole says, hi there. Hi there. I want to update my setup in in a small budget. I have used AT4040 mic and M Audio BX8 speakers. What do you recommend, microphone or speaker, uh, for example, $500 to $700 budget? Total Thanks. budget is $700, and we're getting yeah. They say $500 to $700, so let's 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 assume we can we can hit that. Okay. Um, well, obviously, you got to get new speakers. Um, so uh, coming from the VX8s, you might be used to uh, all the bass that those provide. So you would probably want to get LP8s. Um, so that's going to set you back $400. And then you've got $300 left for a microphone, which is a good budget for a good microphone. I am using and would highly recommend the Lewitt. Uh, this is a 640TS, which I think is a $600 microphone. This is a, a dual element. Um, but they have single element mics that run between, I think, $249 and uh, $400 that are also excellent. Um, and I couldn't recommend that uh, highly enough, especially for that budget. Got it. All right. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Nate. Uh, now, oh, here's an interesting question about stands. This is from BLRX. Hi, BLRX. Thank you for your question. Uh, they say for studio monitors, uh, are metal stands required uh, at all times, or can we make DIY wood stands? Uh, any tips on stands would be appreciated. Yeah, DIY stands are awesome. Um, I wish I had the time and carpentry skills to make those for myself. Um, the biggest thing that you want to take care of with a stand is you want to make sure that there's no uh, rub and buzz between the bottom of the stand and the floor and the top of the stand and the speaker. Um, and so some rubber pads. Um, it was in one of like the premier studios in the world um, recently, and they literally just use old strips of neoprene um, to put the speakers <laughs> on stands, and that and that's fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just sort of hilariously cheap. Um, so yeah, just make sure if you're using your own stands um, that you don't have any rub and buzz, um, and then if you can. Um, the stands I use, these are the ultimate um, support stands. These have cable channeling within them, which is really cool. Um, but other than that, I would say try not to build too many cavities in your stand because those can act as base traps. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for that advice. So let's see. I want to skip down to Akshat Kavadial. Hello, Akshat. Are, they want to know, are LP6 mid-heavy like the Yamaha HS5. Nope. LP6s are flat. LP8s are flat. IN8s are flat. Um, that is our design goal, is to give you uh, a speaker that doesn't bias any frequency over any other. What that means is that when you've mixed your record on our speakers and you take it to the car or you ship it to your client, um, 
what you heard on our speakers is going to be retained on other systems as best as possible. All right, there we go. And I think uh, uh, Adi Abadi, that should answer your question uh, where they said, I intend to order LP6s or LP8 for a client today. Terrific. So if the room is treated well, could you tell me honestly, how well do either of these monitors translate recordings and mixes in the real world? Yeah, so if you look at, and you know, we haven't done a scientific study, but um, if you look at every playback system in the world, they're going to center more or less around being flat in terms of the average response. You know, some things are going to be too bass heavy, some things are going to be scooped, some things are going to be just mids. But if you look at everything, um, that centers around a flat frequency response. So the best chance that you have of translating to as many systems as possible um, is to mix on, on a system, and that means speakers and room and whatever else you're using, uh, where you have a flat frequency response, where what you're hearing through the speakers is an accurate representation of the track that you're mixing. Um, there is an old idea that you should mix on shitty speakers because people are playing back on, sorry, crappy speakers. Um, it's okay. <laughs> uh, and um, that's just not, I don't think that holds up. Um, and maybe this is just a matter of opinion, but I'll state it this way. My opinion is that um, that isn't going to work for you because um, no crappy speaker is the same as any other crappy speaker. Um, just because a speaker doesn't sound good doesn't mean that it doesn't sound good in the ways that other speakers don't sound good. And so you don't have that much of a better chance of making something that will sound good on a bad playback system by mixing it on bad speakers. Okay, all right. That was, that was kind of a, a, a logical path. I hope everybody followed that. And uh, Nate, I, I'm not sure if there's a real difference in shock value between shitty and crappy. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna put that out on a, on a separate poll, everybody. And we, we really want your, your feedback on that. Uh, now, uh, this, is, this is a great question uh, from Wolfsang Muse. Is there a magical dimension room? A magic dimension room. Oh man, um, I I would love to be able to say yes, and this is it. Um, I have not done enough work to be able to say that yet, um, but I suspect strongly that a golden ratio room is going to be uh, as magic as they come. Um, so the the width is one, and then the depth is one point six or so um is uh is what i think is going to be as best as possible give me just one sec yeah sorry but well, that's what that is um can I you hear background start... noise i uh, just just slightly i was gonna okay. start to sing to fill some space so good thing you resolved <laughs> that okay sorry about that um yeah so yeah you about yeah the, the magic dimensions um there is uh if you're a classical music nerd um, there's a hall in Austria, which is the Musikverein, which is where the Vienna Philharmonic plays. And it's a shoebox. The dimensions are a shoebox, basically. So it's about mm. this long, this wide, this tall. Um, and it sounds great. It's the best sounding hall, uh, a lot of people say, in the world. Um, and I'm tempted to believe that the dimensions of that hall, if you scaled them to whatever you needed your room to be, um, would work really well for the vast majority of people. Um, but I don't know, I haven't done the research um, and I don't wanna to say too strongly like this is it and this is what you ought to do. Right, right, got it. Yeah, at the end of the day, uh, translation like boils down to to some personal experience as well. I mean, right, that's, you're, you're gonna to have to play, play your mixes and play them in a number of places and, mm -hmm. and figure out your deficiencies. So. So one person's magic dimension could be another person's not magic. Uh, so now, um, okay, uh, Nicholas Raymond wrote about placement. How about horizontal? Yeah, so the ionates, yes. Um, and in fact, any coaxial system, yes. Um, with the LPs and really with any two-way system, especially one that has a an elliptical waveguide. So basically if the waveguide is wider than it is tall, 
don't put it horizontal um, because what that's made to do is give you or an ideal dispersion pattern for the tweeter uh, in that vertical um, dimension. Um, so either put it right side up or upside down um, and constrict what the tweeter is doing as best as possible um, coming out of the top and bottom. Um, so if you put it horizontally, you take what should be a really nice spread out even sound stage um, and put that into a dimension where it doesn't matter and then take this constricted, let's keep the sound off the floor and ceiling um, and put that into your horizontal dimension. And so you kill the sound stage. Okay. All right. Is everyone listening? Thank you, Nate. I'm, I'm just loving your expertise and I can really tell you, you've heard it all and you've seen it all or, or you've heard and seen a lot of it, right? <laughs> a uh, lot of it. Yeah. I, I, I love that it's all available right there in your brain. Uh, here's here's an interesting question from Deepesh Sharma Batalvi. Hello, Deepesh. Thank you for your question. Would you recommend IN8s for mastering? I am concerned more about the inherent amplifier noise. Uh, and uh, everyone has a problem with, he says, when working with Callies. Yeah, so um, there is some self-noise from the Class D amplifiers that we use. Um, it is something we are working on, wink, wink. Um, uh, but yes, I would recommend them for mastering. Um, we just did an ad with a mastering engineer who uh, I'm close with, named Will Borza, um, who just ironically, I think, just did Depeche Mode's last record. That's nice. fun that Depeche is asking about that. Whoa. Um, <laughs> yeah, where are we? Um, Cosmic. Uh, he uses the INATs, um, and what he has said about them is that they're his go to for a real world listening experience. Um, because of what the price point is and because of the way that they perform, his viewpoint is this is the speaker that's going to be in everybody's home studios over the next decade or so. Right. Um, and so if you want to know what your clients are hearing, this is the best way to get to it. So he's got barefoots that he uses as his A speakers and then INAs are his B speakers. Um, and he, he really likes using the INAs for that application. All right. There you go. So yes, they are there. You can master with them. Um, and Depeche had a follow-up question. Also, how would you rate their transient response and off-axis response compared to the other three-way systems? Um, off-axis response is excellent. Um, and that is by nature of being a coaxial speaker. Off-axis response on the INAs is about as good as you're gonna get. Um, uh, transient response is, is good. Um, if you're someone who loves ribbon tweeters, um, you might find them to not be snappy enough um uh for the rest of us um yeah the transient response is great i this is this is a matter of personal opinion i don't dig ribbon tweeters um uh and so i find that to be a little too much um but you know there are people who do and i'm not going to say they're wrong um yeah and so that's just they are different than something that's got a ribbon tweeter in them for sure okay all right thank you um uh, here's a question that's uh, apropos to a couple of things that you just said um, when you uh, talk about self noise and that type of thing. It says, which feature of Cali monitors are you current are you currently working on improving? Is that yeah? So that's the biggest thing is self noise. Um, uh, we are looking at um, a sort of second wave amplifier platform that would uh, eliminate that problem entirely. Um, and so that's the biggest thing that we're working on. Um, and then in terms of improvement, um, the ion eights are great. They're huge. That's, that's an ion eight. Um, it's a big speaker. Um, yeah. and so we are working on some, again, wink, wink downscaling, um, of those systems. Okay. All right. We'll see. We'll, we'll see and hear more. It sounds like coming up, uh, B S has a kind of a personal question. It says, Nate, do you just work with speakers or do you mix or play in any bands? Uh, I am currently not in any bands um, and currently I'm not doing any mixing projects other than um, like the marketing videos that I make. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right. Which I'm typically doing so fast that I don't get a chance to do anything resembling a decent mix on them, which, I, uh -huh. which I'm All right. highly apologetic for. Um, uh, but I do, I play piano and guitar. Um, my training is actually as a classical singer. Um, 
And so that's something that I uh, continue to practice uh, most days. Wow, that's fantastic. I didn't, I didn't know that. What, what inspired you to be a classical singer or what, what genre of classical singer are you? Yeah, so I, uh, I went to an arts high school, a public arts high school in Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, we were really, that high school was really uh, clued in with the local opera scene. Um, so one of the local opera companies, whenever they needed a chorus, they used our high school because uh, we were free. Um, and we got to perform in a professional opera, which was awesome. Wow. Um, yeah, it was, it was great. Wow. Um, and uh, so I went to school for opera singing and then came out to the West Coast and I've sung with Opera Santa Barbara and LA Opera. Um, and obviously nothing is going on right now, um, but hoping to pick that up again once uh, right. things are live on stage again. Right. That's, that's fabulous. And now I'll take it one step further. What's something that has nothing to do with music that you like to do? Oh man. Uh, I have two motorcycles. I just oh. got a 1997 Honda Valkyrie, um, which has a flat six engine, which is a, it's a larger engine than what is in the base model civic. Okay. Um, so <laughs> it's great. Yeah. That thing's great. Um, and uh, yeah, I live in Southern California, so I'm blessed with a wealth of great roads to go and drive on. Wow, that's fabulous. So, so you're more of a speed guy as opposed to low and slow? Oh, I'll go low and slow. But, uh -huh. you know, it's, it's nice to have something that can pick up when you need it to. You, you never know when you have to outrun somebody. You never know. Yeah, especially these days. <laughs> All right. Now, let's see. Uh, everyone, your, your questions have been fabulous. Thank you so much. And, th and there's people just saying hi. And, uh, and just so you know, Nate, Mo Roberts just noted that Pittsburgh has a super deep jazz lineage. Is that, is that true? I actually didn't hear that. Yeah, that is very true. Um, so um, there's a district in Pittsburgh called the Hill District, which was um, until it was literally destroyed by corporate interests. It was sort of the African-American cultural district of Pittsburgh. Um, and all of the big name jazz artists came through there. Um, and a lot of guys were from there and then sort of pretended to be from New York because, you know, it was cooler. Um, uh, my high school was actually built on top of a jazz club. Um, and so we got to interact with um, a lot of the jazz musicians uh, who were working um, in Pittsburgh there. Um, and apropos of the opera thing that I was just talking about, we premiered an opera um, called Just Above My Head that was a gospel jazz opera um, that was about um, a gay black couple in the South um, who were gospel musicians dealing with the problems of being a gay black couple in the South um, amidst uh, serious violence from the Klan. Wow. That's that's some intense subject. There, but... It was an intense subject. Yeah, it was it was a hell of a thing to do in 11th grade. Um, right. wow. But again, we were the we were the chorus for that. Um, and then it was uh, professional singers uh, in all the principal roles. You went to yeah. this was a public high school. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we premiered it at our high school. It was on our stage. Wow. You, you went to a very progressive high school, it sounds like. Um, yeah, it was it was cool. It was uh, it it was better education than I got at my uh, big 10 school <laughs> I'll say that in terms of music ed that's right oh we're both big 10 guys which which where did you go again you went northwestern. to that's right that's what i thought northwestern um uh speaking uh mo's question about jazz made me wonder if you have a go-to playlist for reference material what are i what do are yes, oh I'm man sure oh this is great um so i helped very minorly to record a good friend of mine his name's greg spiro he's got a jazz quartet called spirit fingers um that was uh they do a lot of polyrhythmic work um and so it's uh piano bass guitar and drums um and there's a lot going on especially on the low end um uh -huh. and especially the interaction very fast interaction um between the drummer and the bass player um, so I use their record a lot to see what's happening on the low end. Um, uh, I use, um, there's a handful of classical recordings that I use. Um, the recording I know best is uh, from Beyonce's Lemonade, Pray You Catch Me. Um, that vocal line will typically tell me if the speakers are flat or not before the first chorus. Um, and so that's a really good way to dial that in. 
Um, what I would say in terms of a playlist, um, everyone should have a reference playlist. Um, you know, because when you're testing any piece of gear that is in your playback system, you should have some tracks that you really, really know that you can say right away, this is right or this is wrong. Um, and also start to identify what is wrong or right about them. Um, so I have, I have a ton of Beyonce in my playlist. I've got that track from Lemonade because the voice is so clear and I'm as familiar as I am with it. Um, her uh, song Partition has a huge bass hit um, that goes through and it'll go all the way down um, through the audio spectrum. Um, so it's a good way to see, you know, is the sub on? Um, right. And what is the bass doing in my speakers? Um, and then I also use uh, Sandcastles um, because the interaction between the piano and the voice lets me know things about uh, transient response and the frequency response of the speakers. Um, on top of that, um, I think everybody should use um, Girl from Ipanema as a reference track. Oh, it's great. something you've probably heard a lot and it's got, uh, it's got a bunch of different instruments. It's all got a bunch of peculiarities. There are some editing mistakes in there um, that yeah. are good to listen for. <laughs> um, right. Uh, when you're testing a track, I think everyone should have Bohemian Rhapsody okay. on uh, their, their reference list too, because you've heard it on every speaker system that you've ever listened to. Okay, um, right. You know, if there's one track that everybody knows how it sounds, it's Bohemian Rhapsody. True. Um, there's not a lot of low end on it, um, but it will sort of show you, you know, it, are the speakers right or not um, right. in fairly quick order. Uh, Nate, I'm curious with a song like that, which which by now you've heard a thousand times, probably like if, if using it as reference, do you still have the experience that you will hear new information in the song? Yeah, um, yes. And that can sometimes be a little disconcerting. Um, I we are working very loosely with uh, Chip Sheeran who wrote the, the, um, the baseline for Rapper's Delight. Um, and we just set up um, INAs in his studio and um, he was mad at me because <laughs> he was like, man, I got to go back and remix this stuff. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. I hear stuff as I go into new places and as I listen on different playback systems, I hear new things constantly. Yes. Um, I don't mean to get too salesy or, or too, uh, you know, self, self pushing here. Um, with the INA, uh, there were reference tracks that I've listened to a thousand times. Um, uh, Digging on James Brown, the Tower of Power song. Um, it's the specific one that I'm thinking of. Um, where listening to them on the INA's, you know, on most tracks, I'm like, this is great. This is mixed great. This song sounds fantastic. And then I heard them on the INA's and I was like, I could fix that symbol though. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, that is, they are so precise and they are so detailed. They really let you get into that super tweaky. I hadn't heard that before. Sure. Um, and man, there's a lot of stuff and a lot of tracks that you could fix. Um, mm -hmm. that you didn't even know what's wrong. Yeah, I'll bet. So I want, I'm, we have some more questions here and I'm going to get to them. I just want to say Nate that I'd love it if, uh, in the comments afterwards, maybe you can provide us with like, a one of your ref, uh, a reference tracks list, like uh, the ones we were talking about, but yeah, let's absolutely. list them. Uh, I would yeah. love to share that with, with our listeners here. So that's a, a free gift to you, everyone here listening. Who, and we really appreciate everyone being here and, and being so active in the chat. Thank you. Keep, keep them coming. We're going to do this for a little while longer. So uh, please. Um, I'm oh. going to put that in the comments. And then I'm also going to put, um, we have been evangelizing a moving microphone measurement method, um, which in okay. 30 seconds will give you a, a sense of what are my speakers doing in this space or at this listening position. Um, right. So we, there's a video that we did with Hi-Fi Summit um, where we really go over in detail how to do this. It's not hard. Um, it's the sort of thing that you'll do it four or five times and you've got it. Um, uh, that I think anybody setting up a studio should know how to use that method and uh, utilize that to get their speakers in the right place. Right. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Well, so everyone watch, watch for that in the comments and we're uh, we, maybe we'll pin it. Maybe we won't. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to, how to make sure you can find it. So thank you. Uh, 
Okay, Lawless Watson has a good question. Are there any specs to remember when placing multiple sets of monitors side by side? Ooh, yeah. Um, Great question. Thank you, Lawless. Uh, the biggest thing, get the loudest ones on the outside. So max SPL. Um, I would go quietest to loudest from inner to outer. Um, and then just make sure you're following the manufacturer's recommendations in terms of orientation of the speaker. Um, uh, like I said previously, uh, if they're using a good waveguide, that waveguide took a lot of engineering um, and it would be a shame to let it go to waste by putting the speaker in the wrong orientation. Okay, there you go. Uh, all right, great advice. Uh, okay, let's see. Well, or midway. Well, all right, here, some, uh, cross, cross bonnet, cross bonnet, um, you asked, are the LP range tuned for tweeter at ear level or midway between the woofer and tweeter at ear level? That's kind of a variation on a yeah, question. Ear level. Earlier. Okay. Ear level. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Let me, let me scroll down. Everyone. Thanks for keeping those questions coming. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, also speaking about combination of monitor monitors, Jesus Mariano says, how would you place an LP six and IN eight combo? Um, so I would put uh, the LP6s on the inside and then the LP8s on the outside right next to them. Uh, if you can avoid a gap between the speakers, do so, because that can, even if it's small, that can act as a bass trap. Um, uh, and then depending on your sight lines, you might want to have the IN8s uh, on their side or not. Okay. All right. There, there you go for that. Um, this is an interesting question from Rhythm House uh, about reviews. Uh, they want to know what are your concerns with reviews on your monitors from persons that may misrepresent the product. Uh, as a as a media person, I, I'm interested in, in yeah. It, what's, take on that. I really want people's honest reviews out there, um, even if there's uh, things that they don't like about them. I would rather have those be uh, articulated honestly. Um, it, it, there's a handful of people who are just going to rip your product no matter what it is. Um, you know, they don't like you, they don't like the brand, whatever. Um, and there's people who will say good things about everything, no matter what. Um, and, it, you know, I don't find that to be particularly valuable. I think um, presenting this is what the product is, this is what it's designed to do, here's what we think about it. Um, you know, I would like if you want to go and do that review, I will, I will make sure we boost that review warts and all. Um, because I think it's really important that people have a complete sense of uh, what the speakers are. There was, a, there was an idea when the speakers first came out that it was all hype. Um, that you know, we were just paying YouTubers off to say nice things about our speakers. We were paying uh, people like Dave off, like here's you know, however much money, go say nice things about them. And that's just not the case. Um, we provided speakers to people um, uh, for them to do reviews. If they needed some money for their time, we were happy to provide that as well. Um, the positive things that they said about the speakers were their own legitimate positive takeaways from listening to the speakers. Um, and I think if we had more of that, um, where people were being very upfront about this is what I think, um, I think it would be a positive thing for everybody. Um, and so, yeah, when people talk about um, things they don't like about their speakers or about our speakers, um, I hope that it's, it's in between things where they're ultimately satisfied. But at the same time, you know, if these aren't the speakers for you, they're not the speakers for you. And that's fine. There's a lot of good stuff on the market. Um, and uh, I think it's better for people to know that right off the bat to say, all right, this guy liked this, but didn't like this and this. I think I'm in that camp. I'm going to try something else first. Um, sure. that's, that's best for everyone. Right. Yeah. I mean, putting something out there, uh, as a product is not really any different than putting your music out there at the end of the day. Right. Uh, uh, you, if you're, if you're an artist or a producer, you have to likewise be prepared and open to criticism, uh, of, of your music. I, I know I was, I have definitely been in bands with people who could not handle one negative word uh, about about the music or about anything that should be changed. 
you gave them any any type of criticism whatsoever they would go and sulk for days <laughs> <laughs> they they were they were hard to be be with yeah so um yeah i can imagine nate as a as a musician that you developed a thick skin <laughs> right and, <laughs> and an open mind and i mean look it's hard it's hard to hear when people aren't satisfied with our, our products i take it personally um and it's hard not to um sure but i think what's important for us and what's important for musicians too you know if somebody's ragging on you um a determine if they've got a point um if they're just being a jerk fuck them <laughs> <laughs> um uh and if they do see if you can fix it you know if somebody tells you you're not in tune go tune up um or go buy a tuner um if somebody says, hey, I don't like this about your speakers, yeah, all right, we'll, we'll see if we can work on it. Right. Um, you know, uh, if somebody's like, you suck and you don't know what you're doing, it's like, all right, cool, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> right, I see. Uh, here, so now we've got another question, which has ki kind of been answered when we're talking about references, but they, just because they were very specific here, they say, what are some good sa songs to test my monitors and EQ? So yeah um yeah songs that you know well um mm -hmm. i mean that that should be your number one go-to is you know especially if you okay. mix something um and you know what it's supposed to sound like um the other thing is uh you probably know a song better if you've heard it on a variety of systems um so uh again that's why i use bohemian rhapsody because i've heard it on everything right um beyond that uh just some well-produced stuff um that you know if it sounds good on your speakers it probably sounded good on their speakers too and it's probably going to translate um i would say anything beyonce has done okay um, she's got she threw more money than god at producers <laughs> her records sound fantastic um uh anything that daft punk has done um almost every producer i know uses get lucky um somewhere in That's their right. list of reference tracks yes um, that thing that sounds fantastic uh john mayer's gravity is you know say what you will about john mayer but holy crap that song <laughs> sounds great yeah um so yeah um i'd say you know use your own taste to dictate it like dave said earlier i'm gonna put um i've got a 20 song playlist that i will put in its entirety into the comments uh once we're done great yeah we'd love to get that and uh you know we we interviewed Mick Gazowski who produced or recorded and mixed uh, um, the Daft Punk album with uh, with Get Lucky Random Access Memories uh, right uh, that's the name of the album yeah am I am I correct and yeah just hearing that makes me uh, depressed that we won't have AES this year since I guess oh. that means I won't be hearing Get Lucky every three feet <laughs> <laughs> as I wander the halls of of the Javits, uh, but that 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 song to me has actually become absolutely inseparable from the experience of of going to an audio convention. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, but it, it's it sounds fantastic, and everyone go to Sonic Scoop and and read about Mick's experience uh, making that album because it's really uh, it was it was really he had a very unique experience with it, and he's. A fantastic engineer right there right there in la uh do you ever get to see mick no i've never met him i would love to i can't believe it oh he well nick, nick is a wonderful character and, and was one of our most popular mixcon uh uh presenters uh, a few years ago uh, at the manhattan center so yeah i'll uh, let me uh let me see what i can do uh there to to connect you guys it'll be a memorable day um and we this isn't a question but we i like what uh chester dorn has said here they say one thing to remember people make music cheers we agree with that absolutely yes. thank you um so and i i think we're we're coming soon to concluding so if anyone has any other questions that they want to ask please put them up there now um because what I want to conclude with otherwise is, Nate, we had an interesting discussion when I asked you, I was just curious what you have seen and discovered in your travels building up Cali Audio. And, and I, I thought you, you had some interesting observations and, and perspective to say about that from the 10,000 foot level. 
Yeah, one of the things we got to was that, um, you know, I've been to a lot of studios uh, from, you know, the, my friend Craig's home studio to the top flight recording studios in the world. Um, and one of my biggest takeaways is that um, everybody's got their own way of working. Um, and if it works, it's right. Um, and uh, the people I see who are happiest in what they're doing um, really just have their processes down. Um, Maria Lisa in the, in the live stream that she did earlier this week um, talked a lot about, you know, this is, this is what I do before I even start when I'm looping the track over and over um, to start building my workspace um, and talking about the color coding that she uses um, and how she uh, sets up the whole song horizontally so she knows, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, um, and how it's sort of this weird uh, bilingual mix um, where she's using Spanish for some things and English for some things, and it's um, it's very idiosyncratic. Um, and she talked about um, one of the things she said. She was like, "You could say that I'm wasting time or that I'm spending too much time doing this, right. but yes. actually, I'm saving time because while I go into my mix process and know where everything is at a glance, I know exactly what I'm looking at." Um, and so this, this allows me to work faster, this investing the time um, in the front end. Um, and, you know, my takeaway from that is exactly what I said. Everybody's got these ways to work. And once you've developed something that works for you, don't worry about, is it, is it the right way to do it? Um, am I buying the right equipment? Uh, should I go out and spend $500 on, on room treatment? Um, if the track sounds good, it sounds the way you want it to at the end of the day, you did it. <laughs> you did it right. Um, and uh, I think that especially as this profession of mixing becomes much more democratic where the equipment is less expensive, um, the spaces are not as uh, budget, uh, you know, you don't need to be in the village studios. Um, a lot more people can mix and I think people should feel good about um, what they're shipping uh, is a professional product. Um, then there shouldn't be, um, there shouldn't be this feeling that just because you did this in your bedroom or just because you did this on budget gear um, or just because, you know, this isn't your uh, thousand percent profession. Um, this isn't the only thing that you do that makes you money um, that you're not doing it at a high level. Right. Um, if you're doing it, you're doing it and, and cheers to you. Um, right. And you should feel great about that because it's one of the coolest things you can do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know that when I was producing a lot more music than I am now, and I was consuming a lot of media about how to record and mix that I was always looking for that validation and that reassurance that there was not one specific way to do things and and that's something that we try and get across on sonic scoop as much as possible that that there is no right way uh and and that you should find you should find your way uh and be able to to me success is being able to make music that you heard in your head uh and ah. you were you were able to get out there um and, uh, you know, and, and be satisfied that you were able to create something that, that you had to hear and you realize that you're going to be the one that has to do it. <laughs> if you want to hear this thing, you're going to have to be the one to make it because uh, cause you had the vision for it. And I think uh, monitors like Cali Audio are, are so important in making that happen and getting people closer to their vision. Uh, so Nate, thank you for making these tools and, and bringing these things within reach to people. Uh, and thank you for being a part of MixCon 2020. Uh, thank you for being here with me today. For everyone here who, who rode, around, rode along with us, we had a great crowd. Uh, we'd love to take you home with us. <laughs> we'd love to take you home. Uh, if we did not answer your question here on this live stream. We see it here and we will uh, see a way, find out if there's a way we can get Nate to get to it uh, in the comments or such like. So thank you so much for being with us, Nate. Thank you. We're gonna, we're gonna bring this to a close and, and, and get to Friday because 
I know it's Friday. That's right. I'm not a touring drummer. I'm having a weekend. <laughs> you know it's Friday. Everyone out there, if you didn't know it was Friday, now you know today is Friday. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Dave. See ya. Bye-bye.